Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to welcome our entertainment pundit back on the show for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews Entertainment Rundown. Mr. Michael Nichols Payne, how are you this fine day? Thriving and surviving. Thriving and surviving. Just like a true American, thriving and surviving. Michael, we are going to be talking about one of your favorite subjects, and I'm so proud to have you on to talk about this subject because I feel like we don't talk about it enough on this show. And with your new segment that is exclusive to the website, Lights of Broadway, why not bring you on to have a full in-depth conversation about Broadway, about your new show, Lights on Broadway, and what you have been seeing lately and what you will be seeing in the future hopefully if you get the chance to go back to New York because I understand as a true New Yorker you are not a fan of tourists at Times Square so you just do not like to go to Times Square as much as possible so Michael thank you for doing this I'm so excited y'all better buckle up because you thought I could talk (laughs) about movies and things for lengthy periods of time oh no this is this is this this is everything this me. is reality and i oh <laughs> she does know the words <laughs> so i am honored to have you on and i like i said we're going to start off with a kind of a background we did it a little bit earlier on in the season with the bunbury players and talking about your introduction to theater but i want to go into a little bit more in depth here i want to ask the big old question sure First introduction to Broadway was what show? Beauty and the Beast. Do you know who was playing them? Was it named actors or were they sort of B-list actors? Well, Broadway is interesting because even some of the like big names on Broadway are considered like C or D-list actors in the grand scheme of things. So it's, and when you do get like an A-list actor, it's usually a stunt cast and it's done to try and save money. (coughs) <coughs> funny girl <coughs> oh, music man. I don't know where that came from um, but uh, most of the time like some of the big names that you'll hear a lot like Patti LuPone Bernadette Peters uh, Brian Darcy James they're not really going out there and getting a lot of roles in film and TV because people tend to when they do Broadway stay on Broadway and when actors do make the jump you rarely see them go back to film and that kind of media. What do you mean by that? So Broadway actors going to TV don't usually go back to Broadway or vice versa? No, vice versa. So TV actors or film actors who go to Broadway go, uh, this is much better and it's more uh, convenient for me. So I'm not gonna go back to the hustle and bustle of TV and film. Filming schedules are miserable. And sometimes you're filming from like five in the morning to not 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and a lot of times you're not getting the type of recognition that you get with Broadway. Broadway's hard. Eight performances a week, two on Wednesday, two on Saturday. Monday's your only real day off. So a lot of people like to do Broadway because it kind of hones their craft, which is why when you do see Broadway people transition to films and TV shows, it's like insane you watch the early seasons of orange is the new black with uh danielle brooks and then after 2016 when she had uh finally left the she did color purple on broadway at the revival and she left it watch those later seasons i think from the prison riot onward danielle brooks is a whole different person and her acting is light years better because it's almost like boot camp so people really like doing it now danielle brooks is coming back to broadway or piano lesson and she's doing a lot more Broadway roles and coming and she's a big, huge example of it because she's just never really did it, did the once and then has now like signed, sealed, delivered it, <laughs> loves Broadway. So I want to go back to the original question that I asked, sure. which, which was about Beauty and the Beast here. Um, do you remember that show? Do you remember that experience? Because you've you've tried to get me to a Broadway show on numerous occasions, and I, I promise that once I actually do come down to New York, we will be in that process of sitting in a live theater and Chris not moaning and groaning about how boring the acting is, because that's what usually I do during a movie, and I you speak won't loudly. Be able to. 
oh, trust me, I will. Trust me, I will. I will be that one guy who sits in the background going, can someone just pass the popcorn to me? Because I really would love it. Um, Bring a notepad, take notes. <laughs> not going to happen. But do you remember that first experience? Do you remember going into that theater to see Beauty and the Beast? And what was that experience like for yourself? Because you're relatively close in the grand scheme of things to Broadway. So it is a natural progression that all New Yorkers have probably seen one Broadway show or another. So you would think, but Broadway's expensive. So okay. a lot of times, um, some New Yorkers, especially if you're not into theater, they just avoid it altogether. Um, and I'm going to be honest, Beauty and the Beast, though it was my first Broadway show, I don't remember too, too much from it because I was very young at the time. Um, I was under the age of nine or eight or something like that, because this was 97, 98 that it was there. Um, I know you're giving me the dirtiest look ever because I just told you how young I was. <laughs> was this prior to Beauty and the Beast coming out via VHS movie? Like, was the Broadway show prior to the movie or vice versa? After. Broadway came after. Which, with a lot of the Disney stuff, they do the movie and then they do the musical if the movie does really well. And if it feels like it can be a, a Broadway show. Which is why I do think we're going to see Encanto on Broadway at some point coming. Um, Disney loves its Broadway because it makes them a lot of money when it hits like Lion King hit. When it flops, though, it flops hard. Tarzan. Any, any, oh, did Tarzan flopped? Oh, yeah. Little Mermaid. I, I, I'm not the resident Broadway expert. I know, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not saying that as like a, you should have known. I'm saying like, oh, no, it was like, <laughs> Did you see it? No, and I wish I had. You always want to see the flops, right? You always want to see I'm the flops. I'm obsessed with it. Bad <laughs> shows. I'm obsessed with bad shows. You never want to see the good shit. <laughs> I got to see Bonnie and Clyde uh, when it was in previews and that show was so bad. It was so bad. I don't know how it made it like as long as it did make it. It, it, it is what it is. That's the, the, the curse yeah. of uh, Broadway, I guess, right? You stay on forever or you don't. Um, why is Broadway such a draw? Because, in, and I say this in the nicest way possible because we have theaters up here in Canada, whether it be in Calgary, Toronto, you have theaters in Seattle, you have theaters in uh, uh, all across America and Canada. But there's something about Broadway, right? When you say, oh, the show's on Broadway, there's a prestige to it in some sense that most other towns and cities don't get. So what was it about Broadway that captivated the the theater going experience i think that's just i'm gonna be honest i don't know why they picked new york city i don't know why that ended up being the central hub for where all the theater kind of came up i do believe it has something to do with when the follies were going like zigfield follies and all the other folly shows they would originate in new york and then would go on tour across town across the country because um, touring productions, they'll do that now. You'll see shows go up in these different theaters and then tour across the country and hit like city after city after city. Um, a good example of a show that I'm seeing, or I saw this past time, Moulin Rouge, now is touring across the country. It's doing a mini residency in LA right now at the Pantages Theater. It's going to be in uh, Seattle for a little while. Um, but, but it's you you don't start off on Broadway, right? Like, the, no. So that's what I'm trying to get to is you you make it when you get to Broadway, right? Like if the show goes to Broadway or even off Broadway, which we'll talk about a little bit later about what off Broadway and on Broadway means. But when you start off a show, you're not starting right at, in New York. You're usually starting in Chicago, New Jersey, somewhere smaller to get the kinks out, right? Sometimes, sometimes shows just go right to Broadway. Really? And, Are those usually the flops? Well, Music Man went right to Broadway, this current version. It didn't do an out-of-town trial, but one right now happening in Boston that is making the transfer to the Roundabout Theater is uh, the 1776 revival that is all uh, women, trans, and non-binary cast. Because anyone familiar with this show it is normally 26 men, two women. The two women sing exactly a song and a half. If you count John Adams' wife, and that's it. Um, 
And so it is a reimagined modern version that take, took the approach of Hamilton of the story of America then told by America now. And it's an entirely um, different diverse cast. It's amazing. I'm super excited. That's doing an out of town tryout right now in uh, Boston. Wow. There's, another, there's another one in La Jolla, California, Lempica, about the artist Lempica. Uh, amazing. It's got great music. It has Eden Espinosa in it, who is a big name on Broadway. And it's uh, a lot of times we'll see out of town tryouts, kind of just like you said, to work the kinks out to see if it's worth transferring. Sometimes things transfer that it's like, how did that make it out of make it the transfer? Uh, a really great example of this is the Princess Diana musical happened at La Jolla at the La Jolla Playhouse. And then they decided it was grand enough to transfer to Broadway. Didn't that win a few Razzie Awards? Like, come on. Yeah, it was, uh, it was amazingly bad. And I'm so sad that I didn't get to see it live because I watched the Netflix filmed uh, pro shot and there was all these costume changes and transitions and things. And you know, they weren't nailing it every night because some of these were tight. Um, okay. So I, I, I want to get to this whole off Broadway here for a moment, like sure. out of town Broadway, I should say, like sure. the, the starting moment, because I, I'm a film aficionado and I, I hate to use that word, but I, I watch films, you watch films, we, we, we try to stay up on the, the know of what's happening in the entertainment yeah. business for the show and for everything else. There doesn't seem that many, there doesn't seem to be that many leaks when it comes to shows in, in theater, whether it be like, oh, this show's doing really bad or this show is like getting really bad reviews. Maybe it's because it's smaller markets and there's not really that much media attention. But why do you think that Broadway doesn't get the fine tooth comb nitpicking of like the TMZs, the uh, the entertainment world, ET Candy, ET Now? Like, why isn't it that theater is so looked over in the grand scheme of things when it comes to what's happening actually in the theater? Well, there's a lot of news that gets out. I mean, the reviews really can tank a show. Funny Girl was really doing, and as a great example of this, was doing well, got terrible reviews. And then like, there's been a lot of drama surrounding Beanie being ousted and Leah Michelle being dragged in and- um, Dragged in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but a lot of times with theater, it's- but do you think really people know, like do people notice that stuff like because you're you you told me and I was like okay that's kind of cool and I, I sent you the link oh Leah Michelle's in Funny Girl now because everyone knows Leah Michelle but yeah. I'm not hearing things about like the backstory of Paradise Square so like why is it that only when a big name actor comes into a show to replace somebody that's when you hear about a show. The big thing is, because there is tons of news, like especially Paradise Square, which I know we'll talk about <laughs> in more depth later. Um, theater people are looking up a lot of that stuff, but it's not considered mainstream. Because like I was saying at the beginning, even at times, the biggest names on Broadway aren't necessarily A-list actors. So you're not getting the media attention, the paparazzi attention, people kind of clamoring for what's next, what are they doing, blah, blah, blah. Theater people are like, we're crazy, we're doing it. but many times like also with the theater folks and like like patty lapone she's notorious for popping her mouth off she'll sometimes make the news because she just goes overboard like stopping the middle of gypsy to yell at somebody recording on their phone or yelling at someone to put a mask on in the middle of a talk back i mean she's she's a lot i love her um <laughs> she's great but many times with theater also like they're not going to come out and say, we're closing this show because it's just not selling tickets because you can go on and see. You can look at the business analytics that they, on Broadway, just on Broadway releases these off. Broadway doesn't usually release their business analytics. But when it's on Broadway, you'll get that sometimes to see how much tickets are selling, if they're making a gross, if they did better last week versus week to week. And at many times you can kind of tell, oh, this show is going to close just because it's not selling tickets or... Uh, this show needs to do something to reel people in, whether it's better marketing or a stunt cast or something like that. Many times theater is very transparent about what's going on. I mean, you can go on broadway.com right now and you could see shows that are projected to come to Broadway in the next like three or four years. Not all of them, 
that some of them that have already like signed contracts with theaters that they want to go into, you can see it on there. Like Camelot is coming to Broadway. It was supposed to come in 2023. It's now being pushed back a year or two. Um, there's uh, Devil Wears Prada right now is doing workshops in uh, Chicago for that musical. And then it's going to transfer and it already has its theater picked out. I mean, a lot of times theater is just so transparent too, that you're seeing a lot of the information when you're looking for it. And it's not as like spicy and drama. Like there's a lot of drama with Funny Girl right now and it's unheard of. Like it's very weird for theater to have this much drama, like very like national drama. You, you, you talked about on and off Broadway and we'll get a, we'll get to drama a little bit later because we, we, we have lots of drama that's going on in mm-hmm. Broadway right now. But the on and off Broadway lingo to an average person like myself, I'm thinking, okay, there's Broadway street. And if you're on Broadway, you are on that street. If you're off Broadway, you're on a street off of the street that's called Broadway. But I'm assuming because of the massive grin on your face right now, I'm a simpleton from Calgary, Alberta, and you're from New York state. So you know all this. So what's no. the difference between on Broadway and off Broadway? My, my American yokel. I can't stand that voice. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's super confusing. And a lot of people don't actually understand. There are people that do that like theater and that participate in theater that don't understand the difference. Um, so a Broadway stage is any stage in Manhattan that is above four, that is 500 seats or above. That's what qualifies you for a Broadway, to be a Broadway theater, 500 seats and above. Uh, and it does not, what? Is there a lot of is there a lot of theaters that have more than 500 seats? Oh yeah, no, there's the biggest theaters are the Palace Theater and the Winter Green, Winter Garden Theater. Um, Palace Theater, I think has a 1500. Winter Garden has a close to a thousand, I wanna say. Um, I could be very wrong about the seat numbers. I just, that's the big thing to qualify and to qualify for the Tony Awards, you have to be above that 500 seat mark for your theater, for your show, Oh, which is, Now, off-Broadway is any Broadway theater in the island of Manhattan that is 100 seats to 499 seats. So you have to be at 100 seats or more, and you have to be under 499, because if you are above 499, you are now considered on-Broadway. If you are below that 100, so if you're 99 seats or lower, you are considered off-off-Broadway. And you have to be on the island of Manhattan, did you say? That seems very suspicious. Like, what? Like, is, okay. Like, no, that's, that's just because that's where broad. Like, but Broadway, Broadway, but is. is that is that Broadway as well? Like, uh, like to be Broadway, you have to be on the island of Manhattan and, and over five hundred seats. Yeah, very. Few, there are very few theaters that are directly on Broadway, the actual road. Okay. A lot of the theaters are off, like on Forty Fifth Street. There's like four theaters. There's one in the Marquee Hotel, which I think is 46th, 47th Street, something like that. Like a lot of the theaters aren't necessarily on broader Broadway, like whatsoever. Like you can't see them from Times Square. You can walk all the way up and down and not see a single one. Wow. You could, there's the Lion Kings is directly there. There is uh, the Palace Theater, which is currently being renovated. Is there a stage to be, uh, like for a theater production, uh, is there a prestige to be on Broadway? Like, is that what the ultimate goal is? Like, do people care? Like, if I'm Joe Smo and I'm going to a Broadway show, am I thinking, oh, this is off Broadway, so this is a true Broadway experience? Or uh, would they go, okay, I still had a good time. I don't care if there was 499 seats or 502 seats. It just doesn't bother me. Like, does, does the average person who goes to the theater care that if it's on Broadway or off Broadway? Or is it just a title for Tony Awards to say, well, you're not on Broadway. It's really just a classification. Like the average theater person going is going, because like off Broadway and Broadway qualify for the Drama Desk Awards and for the Critics' Choice Awards. And for a lot of the, all the theater, the only theater award that off Broadway is technically like barred from is the Tony Awards, which is specifically for being on Broadway. Off-Broadway shows now are also having some of some of the bigger budget stuff going on too. I mean, you look at the play that goes wrong, that's considered off-Broadway. And that's been running for a long time and is high budget. 
Um, you also have now there's a new production of Little Shop that has been stunt casting from the beginning. So we know it's not done to save because they've been having, they had Skylar Aston as, uh, what's his name, Seymour. They had uh, Jonathan Groff as Seymour. They've had a lot of different folks as Seymour <coughs> specifically from the jump to try and get people. That's considered off-Broadway and there's been a lot of money dumped into it. A lot of the times the- big- Which would you prefer? Like as, as a, someone who goes to the theater on more of a regular basis than I do, um, mm-hmm. what would you prefer? Would you rather go see a show that's off Broadway or on Broadway, or does it matter to you? And you just, you're going to see the show and not the, the status of Broadway on Broadway or off Broadway. So for me, it doesn't really matter. Like this time around, I saw Winnie the Pooh, the musical, which was off Broadway. It was not considered on Broadway. Um, it's also about to go on a tour, which is really cool. Uh, but it was not one that it's not going to qualify for Tony Awards. It's just an off-Broadway show. I was really excited to see that. For me, it doesn't really matter. If I'm excited for a show, I do tend to gravitate towards seeing shows that I want to see. Granted, with regards to the Tony Awards only being for on-Broadway shows, I typically tend to lean more towards that just because when I do watch the Tony Awards, I like to say, oh, I can, I feel I can predict this because I saw most of the nominees for this. So I have a sort of like when I watch the Oscars, I watch as many, if not all of the movies nominated so that I kind of know what's going on and can have opinions versus, well, I saw this one show nominated in this category of six different people. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I understand where you're coming from. But I want I want to move to, as you just said, some of the shows that you've recently been showing because recently be seeing because, as I said at the beginning, uh, Michael's been doing Light to Broadway, which is the Cross Border Interviews uh, web exclusive. So go to the Cross Border Interviews web page. You can read his reviews for some of these great uh, uh, theater productions some not great uh, theater productions as he will show uh, the link to the Winnie the Pooh and Moulin Rouge, the two most recent ones that he has gone out and seen will be in the show notes. So highly recommend that you check it out because like I said, they are great. And if you are going to New York and are looking to check out a theater production of something, check out this because you would not be sorely uh, uh, you you'll know what to go see and what not to see. Um, but you, as you just said, you've just gotten back from New York. Uh, you were down there for the weekend and you saw two shows, Winnie the Pooh and Moulin Rouge. Um, so let's start with the one that you already started with, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, you said that in your review, you gave it glowing reviews. Why was that? It was just really fun. I mean, it's not going to be an award winning show. Like the story was very simple. Uh, it was. Only Were you the oldest person minutes. there? Were you the no, oldest? No, <laughs> I sure <laughs> wasn't. Oh, wow. Okay. But there we, we were far outnumbered by children's to adults uh, at that theater. Because it's, it's a kid's show. And we went to the 11 a.m. showing of it because it's, I was like, great, we could do that. And then maybe I'll get to squeeze in a third show depending on how the day's going. And my friend ended up being like, no, nah, let's just do the two. And I'm like, that's fine. I planned only for two, was hoping maybe a third. But um it was, it was fun. The puppets were really cool. And I, I'm a sucker for puppets. If a show has puppets involved, I'm going to see it. I got to see the King Kong, uh, the musical in 2018, 2019. I want to say May of 2019, uh, which that show was a train wreck with that 26 foot tall puppet of King Kong was amazing. Um, it was very, it was life-size realistic and like, I'm a sucker for puppets. And so these puppets were really cool. The way they were operated were really cool. The way that they chose to not have the actors in all black and instead have, have them in like different costumes that matched the characters was even better. Um, and from, it, the, from the way that I read on the uh, review that you gave on the website, which again, link in the show notes, um, they interacted with the audience as well, right? And this, and for me, like, I, I, I imagine you go to Broadway, you're going to go basically watch a movie. You're going to go there. You're not going to do a lot of part, uh, audience participation. There might be a few shows that might, but this one was a lot of audience participation, wasn't it? Not so much a lot, but every once in a while, who would look over and be like, 
do you see Tigger? Like the, the whole Dora the Explorer thing of like, do you see Swipe? Like it would be sometimes that. Also because it was kids, kids don't know how to act in the theater. So at one point Winnie the Pooh was stuck in the tree getting honey from the beehive and Piglet and Tigger were walking around, walking around looking for Pooh. And they're like, I don't know where Pooh is. And this little girl in the front row screamed, he's in the tree, look there. And then all of a sudden you hear her mother go, that's not how we behave in the theater. And I was cackling. Um, <laughs> but the kids were interacting with it and, and not so much the audience like talking to, uh, or not, not so much the actors talking to the audience, but the audience kind of talking back and the actors reacting a little to what was being said. Like it was really cool. And it was a really great family friendly show. Um, especially if you're a huge fan of like Winnie the Pooh, they did a lot of the songs from it. Um, from the Disney movies and it, it's just it's a lot of fun I'm not surprised it's off Broadway though because I don't think it would pack a Broadway house and the other movie that the other movie the other uh, show that you went to go see is Moulin Rouge now a little bit of a backstory here and I'm gonna throw Michael under the bus here do a it a little bit um, you were a little bit apprehensive to go see this show at first because uh, you and I, I think, I think you said you saw the movie and wasn't in that impressed with the acting. I hate that, the movie. There you go. I wasn't going to say that. But Listen, you know, I'll say it. I will say it. I will shout it. And it always makes people so upset that I hate it. I just hated it. So you went to see Moulin Rouge, which you were not impressed with the movie. So you weren't really sure what to see when you were going to be there. But in the review that you gave, you did give it some critiques, but overall you were left with a good impression. Now, why was that? This is the big thing with Broadway and like specifically on Broadway. Um, Cause I, I mostly went, my friend that I went to go meet up with in the city, he was dead set on wanting to see this show. So I said, okay, perfect. I will see it. Cause this is, this is something you want to see. And I would never personally want to go, but you know, I know it's going to be spectacle because I'd seen pictures of how they transformed the theater. I mean, you walked in and it was like, a, the Al Hirschfeld did not look the way it normally looked. And I've seen shows there before. It was fully transformed. I mean, six chandeliers and draped curtains and a windmill that was working and the blue elephant or purple elephant or whatever color it was in the corner. And then halfway through doors open, um, and the show starting, actors just were walking around the stage. This gentleman in a corset and a thong was like doing splits in front of us. It was insane. It was, and then the first 20 minutes was probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen on Broadway. It was one of the best openings I've ever seen. And it was just introducing each character, jumping from song to song. And like there was fireworks and sparklers. Like I, the only thing they didn't have was literal pyro and live animals. And I was waiting for those two things to show up too, but they were just throwing everything. At, at the end of it, I literally turned to my friend and I went, that's the budget, good night. Like it was, it was wild the amount of money they spent. And it's one of those shows that I think is gonna run for a long time, especially it's a good tourist show versus a traditional or versus being like a theater show if that makes any sense it does and you set up the perfect segue it's like you know me too well that you can just perfectly set me up for segues you talk about a show that runs for a long period of time and you also then talked about earlier on in the interview in the show about how some shows are already predicting to be in certain theaters in 2022, 23, 24, 25. How does that work? Because we all know of the great debacle of Beetlejuice, and I'm assuming Michael will talk about it a little bit here in this segment, but how does a show that is not is relatively new, not really sure if it's going to do well in the actual theater, go on to be a long-standing tradition like Phantom of the Opera, but not get bumped out by a higher profile uh, show like The Music Man, say, and Beetlejuice. How does that work in the theater company? Because if you're saying Moulin Rouge is going to last 10 years or five years or two years, how do I know if I'm going to go to Broadway uh, next year, it's not going to be bumped out by 1776? Well, for one luck if your show is going to run for long term like 
also there's things called uh, limited runs that happen. So like The Lightning Thief was a Broadway musical, a limited run. I think they only did three or four months, which means they only rented the theater for the three or four months they needed. And then they closed. There was no like, we're going to extend this, nothing. Um, a lot of like plays, like The Minutes is a limited run that's set to close or if not, it's already closed. POTUS closes August 14th. Um, that's another one that's a limited run. A lot of the times in plays, you see the limited run. However, if a producer thinks that they have a hit like To Kill a Mockingbird or uh, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice or a lot of times with musicals, they don't do limited runs. It's mostly plays. Okay. Um, so like theaters that have things projected for X amount of time. So let's say, you know, Camelot's not coming till oh, I'm going to throw a random date out. June of 2024. Any show that wants to go into that theater needs to already go in knowing I don't have a theater at this time. However, like with what happened to Beetlejuice, there's something called the stop clause. If the theater, if the, if the show's not making the money the theater thinks it should make, which is an agreed upon amount, they can sometimes just kick the show out for a different show to come in, which is what happened with Beetlejuice. They kicked that show out because it wasn't, performing as well financially but then after out of nowhere all of a sudden it started performing really well and they still had set the close and hadn't even announced it yet but then still had to go forward because the music man had gotten signed onto the theater which is why we're super happy that Beetlejuice is now in the marquee theater because it is selling really well um, but a lot of times with it that it's a producer decision to say okay, my show's not being successful anymore. It's time to close this out, uh, which is what happens most of the time why shows will be there for about a year and then go. It's very rare to, out, to last two or three years in a show on Broadway. It's not the norm. Wow. Yeah, it is not the norm. If you can hit like above 250 performances, you're considered successful usually. On the flip side though, because we, we, we jokingly joked about it at the beginning of this show. Uh, God bless them. There are sometimes there are shows that are flops and yeah. massive flops settle a boot. They will sign a contract, I'm assuming, for six, seven, eight months, year month, year long uh, tenure, if it's a musical or a drama for a limited series or whatever. But let's be honest, sometimes they barely last two weeks. Or in this case of some other issue, where they don't pay their actors and then you get canceled for not paying your actors or your technicians. Um, what happens then? Let's talk about the theater before we talk about the flops and the, sure. the Paradise Valley or whatever the hell you Paradise want to call Square. it. Paradise Square in debacle. Um, if I'm a show, I'm going in there. If I'm a theater, I'm going, okay, this looks like it's going to go well. This looks like it's going to do extremely well. It has big names attached to it, like Spider-Man Turned Off the Dark or whatever you want to call it with Bono and U2. And then it is a calamity. It is a clusterfuck of epic proportions. What happens then? Is there shows already ready to go into a show if they get canceled? Or does that theater now sit dark for six months until they find someone else? Yeah, it'll sit dark. So really? let's say, yo, yeah, they'll immediately start trying to workshop and feel out and reach out to producers they know and say, do you have anything that's looking for a theater? Do you have anything you want to put in? Um, like, do we want to maybe get going on trying to get you into here? Uh, but a lot of times theaters will just sit dark. Um, and that's just the sad reality of it. Because a lot of times with theater, the writing's on the wall. You're not selling tickets. And it's very rare to make back your money. Broadway is notorious for you can spend millions of dollars and lose it all and never yeah. really see a dime. Yeah, it took Hamilton almost, it technically recouped its initial, initial investment in three months. But that's just because they had seven months out worth of pre-sales. It technically took them seven months total to recoup the initial investment. And there are shows that Moulin Rouge, I would, I would be very hard pressed uh, to believe that Moulin Rouge would need anything more than two years of sold out performances to recoup the investment from how much money I saw go into. And that's the initial investment. 
So of course, one show investment. So say for Hamilton, how much money would have had to be put up for that show? Like a million? Uh, easily more than a million. Really? So that is, so initial investment is, you know, before everything you spent money on before the show goes up. So the sets, the costumes, the props, the rental of the theater, the rental of the rehearsal space that you were rehearsing in, the, the theater sitting vacant that you had renting before going in there, any um, actors you were paying to rehearse, any technical people you were paying and hiring, that's the initial investment. Every single cent paid before you open the first door during previews. Wow. Okay. So it is a lot of money. So you said uh, for Moulin Rouge, you saw that it was a lot more money than Broadway. Oh, Hamilton. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was probably more than Hamilton they spent um, getting those costumes and wigs just because of the spectacle piece of it and the transformation of the theater and the number of set pieces. Hamilton's a fairly standalone set on a tournament. And correct me if I'm wrong, for shows like uh, Moulin Rouge, which does not have their own original music, they have to get the rights for all this music that they're playing, correct? Well, a lot of times it's, Moulin Rouge is interesting because it's a jukebox musical. So if it's a jukebox musical, yeah, you have to deal with rights and things like that. But many times, like Strange Loop, a show I saw back in April, May, um, that one's all original music by the person who wrote the show. So he wrote the book, he wrote the music, it's all his stuff. So he doesn't have to pay rights. It's just, he's the creative person behind the entirety of the show. Yeah. Um, so you'd have to pay the director, you'd have to kind of deal with him. He's of course getting a cut of the show as well as being the writer. Or like um, another Paradise Square, different, different book writer and different music and orchestra and stuff like that, but you're not really dealing with rights and license, license, licensing and copyrights and stuff like that because it's the original artist being a part of it that created the material. So what you're saying is, Michael, you and I need to start writing a Broadway show or an off-Broadway show to make money 10 years from now? <laughs> if we make money. No, I'm saying, I'm like, listen, we could dump $10 million into this project. And if it's all you need is one bad review for people to stop buying tickets. And then all of a sudden really? now, yeah, it, sometimes it's one bad review by the right person, Ben Brantley usually, usually. And then all of a sudden your show's not selling enough tickets to make its rent each week. So and then, then do you just, do, do the theater companies just have to say, well, we bombed again. Let's try the next one. And it's not so much a bomb because there's shows that win Tony, like can win every single Tony award that just immediately had to close because they just weren't selling tickets. Usually if you win a lot of Tony awards, it's a good sign, but like company, they made the decision to close. And part of me thinks that's because Patty Lapone wants to leave and not do it anymore since she's been doing it since 2018, 2017. Um, but a lot of times it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's just, you're not filling the seats and it's expensive to stay open on Broadway. And so it's time to just close up shop, which is why you'll see things announce uh, a closing date of we're going to close on this day in like a month and a half, two months. Um, it's very rare to see like a quick close. Normally if you on like opening night get terrible reviews and immediately like aren't selling the tickets and don't have the pre-sales, you'll sometimes see the decision of we're going to close in four months or like a show that I love that's very near and dear to my heart that was on Broadway for exactly four days, Rags, not Ragtime, Rags, had four performances and then it closed. Not four days, four performances. So that bad, eh? Oh yeah. And did you go see it on Broadway? No, I was in the production of it in high school. My, it was my senior show. It's so bad. It's such a fun, it's like such a like, weird show to do and it's just very chaotic and there's a million characters it has a lot of the same issues paradise square has i think which we're going to be talking about here in a few seconds but i'm, I'm going to hold you to the idea i think we have the perfect idea for a broadway show right here american and canadians friendship like honestly we could throw in a few musical numbers and we got ourselves a fucking hit 
I cannot write music, so. I will go hire Deborah Messick. She was in Smash. She wrote a few good stuff. She can't write music. <laughs> um, we'll go Lin-Manuel Miranda. We'll get him. Come on. Great. Alexander Hamilton, but not Alexander Hamilton. We'll be like, Michael and Chris. Michael and Chris. See? I'm out. It's I'm right. not investing in this. It's writing itself already. But we talked about flops, and we can talk about flops to the day we die because mm-hmm. we love flops. But sometimes scandals hit. Sometimes <laughs> scandals hit and causes a show to close without any due warning and go, oops, we forgot to pay our actors and our people who are using the actual, or who are creating this, our costume designers, our, uh, t- our stage hands and all that. And I, I go back to a play that we've talked about a few times and Michael did review it for the, sh- uh, the Lights of Broadway. And that is Paradise Spring? Square. Square, Paradise Square. Michael. I cannot do this justice, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to you for a few seconds. Paradise Square, what happened, and why is this show leaving Broadway so quickly after opening, even though it was actually selling out? No, it wasn't. Oh, it was, it was not selling out. Sorry. Why, why is it leaving Broadway? Because you gave it a good review. A no, I didn't. Semi-good review, I should say. So, What did I give it? I, I feel like I gave it a three. Yeah, that's that's semi good to me. Everything's semi good to me. I'm gonna pull it up at three point five. So you gave it above fifty okay. percent. So which is in the high high marks for you. So yeah. w- what happened to Paradise Square? Garth happened. Garth is the who? producer. The producer. So he already spent time in jail for uh, mishandling, misappropriating. Um, a great example of this, uh, everyone who has seen the producers, both the movie and the show on Broadway or whatnot, I'm sure at some point someone has seen that. Uh, he stole a whole lot of money as producer of Susical the Musical and went to jail for defrauding investors for a whole bunch of fraud. He then came back, was at, was brought on for this show to produce it and to do the money handling of it, which everyone immediately went, Ooh, are you sure? And the show was like, yeah, no, no, no. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. He's, he's then, changed his ways. He's changed his ways. And he, he, he has understand his sins of his past. And now he's better. Yeah, no, he like did it again. Whoops. We're so shook. And I mean, granted this show should have flopped. This show was not great. It should have flopped, so he would have gotten away with it. But he basically has not paid a bunch of actors on the show, has not paid uh, technical people on the show. He's gotten, there's a lot of lawsuits against this production right now. And it kind of out of nowhere announced to close, like we're closing on in a week and that was it. And there was really no explanation about it, which is a shame because the main actress in it, Joaquina Calacango, she was, amazing oh my god she we saw it and i turned to my husband and said she's gonna win the tony award and he goes i agree and did she yeah she won best actress and you i'm gonna say this uh, up front because i just quickly skimmed through your review again you gave it a 3.5 because of the music yes the music was great the story was garbage the biggest issue with it and why i think it would have flopped even if garth wasn't involved is the there was no book, which when someone says a book with regards to like a musical, the book is the written like script, whereas the libretto is the sung script. And so there was little to no book, there's character overload. And there was, I mean, there was a side character that had like a subplot that was a black lesbian couple living in the South during the civil war, free fully free that this that this one of the runaway slave characters was staying like staying with for like a few weeks and it just didn't make sense historically and I'm all for like throwing those stories like putting those stories in but when you're telling a story like this it was just so far detached from reality that it was happening and 
that it was like, it was just every single character on the stage doesn't need a subplot. Some characters just need to be there to propel the story, the main story forward, not to have their own entire plot line attached to them. It just was, it was heavily, is this heavily normal? handed. Is this what? normal? Is this normal? Like the Garth character you're talking about, the producer of this show. Um, it doesn't seem to me like it'd be something that happens on a regular basis. Like you hear movie studios squandering money and trying to rip people off for not paying their actors their fair share because, oh, we're putting it on streaming and we promised you like the Scarlett Johansson. But does this happen more often than not? Or is this a character just the black sheep of the theater community? It doesn't happen a lot. I mean, squandering their does, money. Though. Yeah, because producers squander the money sometimes and spend it unnecessarily in some areas. Now, to the extent of like Garth, where like he was stealing it, not as far as we know, because there's not been too much out there about that. And we have not a lot of them have been caught. But there's a, I mean, producers doing really problematic things. Uh, the producer of Moulin Rouge was me tooed and outed for racial motivations and negative racial motivations. Uh, which caused the main actress, Karen Olivio, to leave the show and not return when it reopened after, during the pandemic. And once Broadway kind of came back, she did not return because of the racial motivation that happened and, and a lot of really de- like underhanded things. This guy's been outed quite by quite a number of people now and is kind of stepping back. Um, there's not been any, any legal recourse that's happened, just he's kind of gone, but producers a lot of times, they, they, sp- they spend money poorly, which is sometimes why a show closes because there's, they spent too much at the initial and it's like, we're never going to recoup this because that happens a lot. You see a show and you're like, this show is fantastic. You spent too much money putting it on. The initial color purple, the very first time color purple was on they had an entire house on stage that like dollhouse opened and spun and way too much money. The revival was a backdrop with chairs and some props and some platforms. And that was it. And it was breathtaking. So it begs the question, and I hate to use him as the shining example, but Mel Brooks did a famous show, the producers where their whole stick was a flop is better than a hit because you make your money if you're a squandering producer very quickly because you can get investors and then, oh, it flopped. Now we go walk away with all this money that we just put in, even though you didn't put in. So I, I got to ask the question and I, because that, I don't know why I keep on saying I got to ask the question. I can just ask the question. Is that true? Is it, is a smart producer sometimes looking for that flop to get investment and then say, oh, it flopped. Sorry, I'm walking away. I mean, what they were doing were like was double fundraising. They raised two million on a show that they were only planning on spending, I think like 500 grand or something like that. So they were planning on, on overspending and not reporting it, which does because once it flops, it's like you don't really have to keep reporting to business analysts on how much money you have. And it's easier to kind of get away with that but you can make more money if you stay open longer. And I think that's the big thing, like not risking all the legal recourse that goes on. And also you can't predict what will happen. You could think, oh, this show is gonna flop. And then it's selling out. Like I would be, I would have said to you in 2011, when Dear Evan Hansen was on Broadway, I would have said, or had opened, I think it was, no, it was 2016. In 2016, when Dear Evan Hansen opened, I would have said the minute Ben Platt wants to leave, this show's closing. They have a flop. It's like, yeah, it has a couple of moments. It's going to win a couple of awards, but like it is going to close. And it stayed open till it's closing this September. It stayed open a very long time. That, at like, I would have lost my money if I was hoping on that flop. And then you have shows like Phantom of the Opera, who has been on Broadway since 1980s. 1988 specifically, yeah. 88, and people are just coming back left, right, and center, because when you think of Broadway, you think of fan of the opera, I guess, and I don't know why, but... It's the longest running show. Is it? It is the longest running on-Broadway show. The Fantastics is the longest running off-Broadway show. Uh, Fantastics has since closed. 
Fantastics ran for, I want to say, like 60 years. But Fan of the Opera has not closed, and we are in a state where it does not look like it ever is going to be slowing down. No, I, I think it should. I think the producers should just allow it to close, not because it's not successful, but because it's reached the point where it's, it's just not creative. Like, it's wasting a spit. And this is where me as someone who wants that theater to be used for another show that might be just as successful. Does it have prime location? It does. And it's a great show, but the tour is more visually stimulating than the new show. The show's dated, like in terms of the production stuff going on, it looks like a show from the eighties, which at the time was groundbreaking. Now it's like, "Mm, this feels like it needs to be updated. What's the draw though? What's the draw? Is it synonymous with Broadway? Do people think, oh, it's Broadway and we have to go see Phantom of the Opera? Like everybody knows the Phantom. Even if you don't know Broadway, you know what the Phantom is. I can't tell you what the actual storyline of the Phantom of the Opera is. But you know it exists. I know that it exists, but I could not tell you a song. I know there's a jilted lover. I know there's a guy who had like wax poured on his face or something like that. And that's about it. And I don't even know if that's all true. And that's my issue is I like, if I'm looking at the only, the only Broadway shows I actually know right now are the ones that you've told me about. And the ones that you review is because I'm like, I'm so far connected, right? Like Calgary, we don't get the shows that you get. We get like, we're finally getting Hamilton. Like Hamilton is in theaters right now in Calgary with their on touring production. And I was looking at tickets. They were like 200 bucks. And I'm like, I'm not going to see a $200 play when I can watch it on Disney. Exactly. When I can get Michael to tell me if I should go see it or not. They had Book of Mormon come through here. And I think the tickets were like 180 bucks. Again, not going to see that. I think Wicked is coming next year. And I'm like, ah. I will always say, especially if you like theater, interested in theater, want to get involved in theater, go find where your lo- where your closest touring house is or your closest touring theater is. Like for me, it's Proctor's in Schenectady. Um, find where that is, see if they do a season pass and buy the season pass. Because normally it's like, 500 600 bucks but you get eight eight or nine shows that you automatically have tickets for every single show because they you the season pass holders pre-buying shows is what gets it because like you may go see mean girls which is selling for like 40 bucks but then phantom rolls in or not phantom but then like wicked will come and wicked is going to sell for a higher price point it's also unfortunate the shows right now that are coming to you are the ones that are still on broadway so that's why they're going to charge a lot more too, because it's, we know that, oh, wicked people want to see that they're going to spend more, but the band's visit, which is an amazing show, Tony Shalhoub from Marvelous Mrs. Maisel as the father was the lead in it. And I believe he won the Tony award, if I'm remembering correctly, stunning show. Nobody's buying tickets to that. So tickets are 30, 40 bucks for it, even though it's probably the better show compared to like wicked. Well, like I, some of the reviews that you've done, like I would love to see what what is it called? POTUS and the uh, women who stand behind him or something like that. Oh, POTUS or seven incredible women trying to prop up one incredible dumbass. Yeah, in like if, yeah. if that came through Calgary, I would love to see that because I know it's stopping its run in uh, in New York and it would, it, it sounds like a good show to go see. The other one that I would love to see is- The Minutes. The, the minutes, but also into the woods. If uh, I know, I know it's not one of the ones that is touring right now, but. But so, it, ooh, this brings up a great point. Into the woods was at City Center Encores. What Encores is, um, is a organization that takes shows that had a run on Broadway or that were there that aren't getting as much love at the moment and does a two week concert series. So little to no set, little to no production value put into it. Just here's the cast, here's the orchestra. They're going to sing and do the show with like little stuff around it. Like and, you have costumes, but that's about it. Yeah. And maybe a little bit of set. Like for yeah. the end of the woods at the city center, it was a ramp and trees that came down. And there was like facades, like flat facades of like mini houses for the cast each at. And they usually will do a lot of like 
big name casting. So like this production had, that I saw had Neil Patrick Harris, Sarah Bareilles, uh, Gavin Creel, uh, I'm trying to think, Heather Heavy, yeah, a lot yeah. of big names. Big and names. it was so popular that it just did the transfer to Broadway, which is not abnormal for City Center, but it, it's, so it's going on right now for a two month limited run. However, it might get extended because it's just selling out and people are clamoring to see it. If it gets extended, I will put money on it touring. And so, or if it gets extended, they may start looking to take things out of the theater that or may start telling places they might want to look for a different theater to keep this running. Because Chicago, the current Chicago production, the, uh, it opened in 1996, was originally a city center two week concert version. And it really? is still running on Broadway. Now it's turned into, okay, we're going to pick whatever B-list, C-list, real housewife of whatever to s- step into the role for three, four months and then put the next one in. No, it's true. You will see a lot of the real housewives when my they do girl, Broadway. My girl, my Canadian Chicago. girl. Are you coming for us Canadians right now? No, no. I'm saying just real housewife girls. Well, Canadian Pam Anderson is in there right now. So. No, she's not. And I really wanted to see her. She's not anymore? No, she only did three months because that's oh. the thing with Chicago. They rotate out the main cast so much because it's one of those shows that there's no set, there's minimal costume. It's just dancing and singing and it's the show and it's very, like it's on a completely black stage, which is why if you've never been to see Broadway before, I would not necessarily recommend Chicago because you're not going to get the multi-million dollar spectacle. You're going to get a very simplistic story, but it's going to be powerfully effective because it's just that's a dance show um and it's usually one that you see like a big name attached to just as like a hey come see pamela anderson for three months i do hope she comes back and does it because i really that i almost went and saw it with her because i want to see her in it she got great reviews Don't pamela anderson's one yeah oh yeah she's one of the best things that's come to that show in a while wow that's i know saying, i'm that's so a happy. lot for you for saying something nice about canadians no wow. i love canadians stop i love pamela anderson too she's great um, but Into the Woods may get an extension because it's- Do you think it will? Big. If you were a betting I, man right now. If I was a betting man, I would say yes. The only thing that's going to stop it is they, a lot of the very famous cast from the city center made the transfer over. I think you'll start to see like Julie Lester is going to have to go and film. Um, Sarah uh, Bareilles? She has nothing going on. No, Julie Lester is going to be the first one, I think, to pull out because she's got that Disney high school musical, the musical, the series that she's got to film at some point. So she may step out and step back in, but she's going to be thinking the first one that if they do extend it, she's going to have like a, I have to be gone Wasn't for Josh a Josh Groban in there for a while? No, he did the Great Comet of 1812 and that was the last thing he did. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, Michael, I want to end on this this segment here, and that's going to be what's next. What's what are you looking forward to? Because there's a lot of coming up, and as we said, we have a amazing reviews that come in every time you go see a show. If you want to support Michael and send him to, to some more shows, because we always love sending him to shows, so he can give us his unabashable uh, feedback on each of the show head over to our support page and you can click on the links through PayPal, through Patreon, or through uh, just e-transfer. And when you do it, make sure you use the note. You you clarify that it's for Lights of Broadway from Michael Nichols Pate so that all that money that you donate will go to him directly. Uh, out of the first few, we have been seeing some donations come in, which is always great. If you want him to go see certain shows, send us your link, send us what you want him to go see. If you want to buy him a ticket as well to go see that show, Show, highly Love recommend that. you can send <laughs> us that you can send us the money through the cross border interview support page and then we'll make sure that he gets to that show as well um but michael what's coming up for you well current so a lot i literally pulled up my list because i've made a long list of things that are currently on broadway and upcoming so the mm-hmm. ones currently there i would like to see mj specifically i want to see the gentleman miles frost who won the tony award playing the role I would like to see him in it. Once he's gone, it's going to be kind of fallen off my currently desired to go see it list. He doesn't look like he's slowing down anytime soon. The show actually may close when he leaves too. So that might just be a reason to go. 
And Throwing things uh, around again. I know, <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, the Kite Runner is a play uh, that came out that closes October 30th. That's another limited run play that just opened this summer that's got a close already set. I want to see that. Six, again, probably not going anywhere anytime soon. I do want to see that. There is Between the Lines, uh, which is, I believe it's the Jody Picoult musical, if I'm remembering that correctly. That's currently out. I would like to see that. And then Upcoming is a very long list. I think the biggest ones from this list that, I've, that I'm very excited for, Kimberly Akimbo, it was off Broadway. It won all of the like, Drama Desk Awards for everything. It has Victoria Clark, who is an amazingly well-known soprano on Broadway. Um, I also really want to see Death of a Salesman. It is from the West End, which the West End is the London version of Broadway. It was there. It was the first time doing an all-Black cast of Death of a Salesman and telling that story through the Black lens. It is making the transfer to Broadway with Andre De Shields. Uh, that is only going to be open from September 19th to January 15th. And so I have to see it during that time period. And then 1776, that's coming too, that I want to see that opens October 6th. Uh, the piano lesson previews for that start September 19th. That has Danielle Brooks and Samuel L. Jackson in it. There's a ton of really great shows that are coming up that are on my list. Uh, Did you miss it? Yes. Oh my God, <laughs> I missed it. It was, it was so hard being in LA and wait, having to wait for the touring production to come through to see shows that I really wanted to see. And a lot of times the touring productions, it's just, they're great. They're awesome. But it's like, oh, I wish I could have seen this on Broadway or right with the original cast because that's what I'm listening to. But the tours are great. Uh, one of the tours, Aladdin, when it came through to LA when I was living there, I saw that three times and paid that price for it. And it was amazing every single time. So, Michael, my last, very last question right Perfect. now, and that is... If there's someone listening to this right here, right now in 2022, in the summer of 2022, as we're recording this, and they're making a trip to New York City to go see a Broadway show, what is the pen, pen, pinnacle show that they should be going to see, in your opinion? Which show should the tourist who is going to New York City, whether it be from Tulsa, Oklahoma, if that's where Tulsa is, or... Faust, Alberta, or Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, or even Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where, what show should they see right now? That's tricky, because it's really kind of a, what do you want to see? Do you want to see the quintessential Broadway show? Phantom's always great. If you want to see a show that is like, this is, this is what people think of when they think of Broadway. Phantom is great. Despite it being dated, it, it's, it's still running for a reason. Um, or do you want to see something that spent the money? Like the big, like, boom, I spent millions of dollars putting this on. Moulin Rouge, Lion King, Wicked. Those are great ones to be like, oh, this is someone threw money at this. Or do you want to see something that's maybe a little more, uh, a little more niche or a little more, okay, I like the stuff that's super popular, but I want to see the stuff that's maybe a little more, a little more thought provoking or a little, a little grittier or a little more in depth of a story. Strange Loop, it tells the story of a fat black queer man living in New York City writing a show uh, and how that process goes for him and his experience with that. It was breathtaking and it won the uh, Tony Award this year for best musical and it should have won best actor, but uh, I'm not going to fall down that loop of arguing that decision by the Tony voting board. It was so spectacular seeing it. I cannot recommend that. Or do you not even want to see a musical? Do you want to see a play? The play that goes wrong is, again, a great show off Broadway that is funny. It spend a lot of money to put it on. It's a good time. Or I know you said you would like to see POTUS. POTUS was hysterical. Uh, there's uh, so there taking, you go, everyone. Yeah, I can, I can give you a reason a show, why. Go just go see a show. <laughs> it, well, and that's the thing. If you're like, it really depends on what you want to see. Do you want to see something that's spectacle, or do you want to see something that's story, or something that's a mixture of both? It's really kind of what do you want to see, and then doing a bit of research to see what that show is. That's true. So with that, I will leave on this note again. 
If you want to read Michael's reviews, head over to crossborderinterviews.ca and click on, or actually crossborderinterviews.ca backslash lights of Broadway, which will be in the show notes. Um, click on the link, read some of the great reviews that Michael has given the show to ensure that you continue to read what is coming up, what he has seen, so that way you can make a best informed decision when you're heading to Broadway. But also, if you want to support him in his ever increasing adventure to become a Broadway reviewer, head over to crossborderinterviews.ca uh, backslash support and support him in his venture and all the money that is raised through him. Make sure that you do add the Lights of Broadway memo so that way it can go to him directly. Uh, and he will go see some more shows and he will give us some more fantastic reviews and he will continuously grace us with his presence on this show to ensure that the lights never go out in Georgia. Bam! <laughs> um, and if anyone, and like, if anyone is going to the city and wants a suggestion, reach out to me on Instagram. Say, hey, these are the three or four shows I want to see. What would you recommend? My friend that I just visited with from Saskatoon uh, came to the city. We met up there and he said, hey, these are the four shows I'm thinking. Which should I see? see I'll everyone, be happy to give you an idea. He's not anti-Canadian. He has friends in two of the ten provinces. So he's kind of cool. <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> Rude. But, but with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews Entertainment Rundown with Chris Brown and our always special guest, Michael Nichols Pate. And remember, get out from behind social media and go have a conversation because it helps our democracy and our society become better. So with that, talk to you later, everyone. Yeah.